Welcome to this video on oxygen and the air. And in this video, we are going to cover these three points. Uh, we're going to look at the gases present in the air, and I'm just uh, using my highlights here. Gases present in the air and their approximate percentages by volume in the air. We're going to look at three reactions that you can do in the lab uh, using these three elements, either phosphorus, iron and copper to investigate the proportion of oxygen in the air and then we're going to look at the lab preparation of oxygen using hydrogen peroxide and manganese oxide. Uh, you may have detected a, a mild level of excitement in my voice and that's because I'm using a new stylus which I'm very excited about using uh, so perhaps my handwriting might be a little bit neater than usual or maybe not. Let's see. So uh, this is a pie chart which I've just pilfered off the internet. In fact, all these uh, diagrams are pilfered off the internet. Um, and hopefully you're familiar with this. Uh, you will see that the majority of the air, 78% um, is made up of nitrogen, 21% is made up of oxygen, and the remaining 1%, helpfully on this pie chart, has been labelled other gases. Uh, now, you might think, ah, well, I know at least one of those gases is going to be carbon dioxide. Let's see how the pen goes, actually. That is a little bit neater than usual. Um, and you might think, well, carbon dioxide is bound to be that other 1%. And actually, carbon dioxide, despite all the stuff we hear about rising levels of CO2 and the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, is increasing, but it's still only 0.04%. CO2, approximately. So, that is a very, very small amount. Okay, the majority of the remaining 1% are made up of uh, noble gases. And the noble gas argon is probably the e well, it is in fact, it's not probably, it is the gas which is in the highest proportion of all those noble gases in the air. Argon um, is about 0.9% uh, composition. So the majority of that 1% is argon. Um, there's one glaring emission from this whole pie chart here, and that's we haven't, well, we haven't included water vapour. Uh, so this is the composition of, well, it should really say dry air. Okay. Um, <laughs> air generally isn't 100% dry. There's usually some moisture in there. So uh, water could be in there up to 4%. Um, but we don't generally talk about that when we're talking about air in general. Uh, now, I marked a, an IGCSE question recently on this topic, and it was what I thought was quite an easy question. And the students who were doing it um, knew all the facts about air, they knew their percentages, um, but where they dropped marks were, was because at this point they got muddled between the difference between a compound and an element, uh, which I found um, quite surprising, because these were, these were excellent students. Um, and... It is important that you realise that nitrogen is an element, even though it's made up of two atoms making the molecule. Both atoms are the same, N2. Oxygen is an element, O2. Uh, carbon dioxide, well, it's made up of two different elements bonded together, so that's a compound. And water is obviously a compound as well. Argon, you'll find that in group zero. Uh, and it's a noble gas, and that is an element. So that's something to be aware of. Let's have a look at the experiments now to determine the proportion of oxygen in the air. So the first experiment we're going to look at is a very simple one, really. Um, and what we've got here is a trough of water, or it could be a beaker of water, and an upturned boiling tube, um, and in the end of this boiling tube up here, uh, the diagram which I've borrowed off the internet uh, talks about using iron filings held onto the boiling tube with Vaseline. Uh, 
when I've done this experiment myself, I've used something called iron wool, uh, which looks just like that. Uh, some grey squiggly lines. Uh, it looks like wire wool. Um, so, or iron wool. And we, we used to call it, well, in fact, we called it when I worked in the lab, Ray's beard, because it reminded us of uh, a chap called Ray and uh, his uh, rather bushy facial hair. Um, and what happens to the iron wool? Uh, if you leave this iron wool, or the iron filings, in, in fact, if you've used those, in this boiling tube over a number of weeks, is it starts to react with the oxygen in the air. Um, it in fact does start to rust so what happens is the level of water in the boiling tube rises up it replaces the oxygen which previously was floating around here and has now become bonded to the iron and that's what causes the water to rise up now this isn't a particularly accurate way of measuring the exact proportion of the oxygen in the air. Um, a boiling tube or a test tube doesn't have graduated lines on the side of it, so it's very difficult to determine the exact proportion of oxygen, or sorry, of the exact proportion of oxygen or air which has been lost reacting with the iron. Um, you can see here that you might think, okay, well, it's risen about. 20% or a fifth of the way out the boiling tube um, and you might put little graduations on there yourself um, but it's not a particularly accurate way of doing this so what uh, another, another way we could do is using phosphorus now this method is much quicker and I think that's important to note that this is quicker than the previous um, experiment and what you have here is a, a bell jar Sitting in a oh, I, think, I, I don't really want that. Um, I don't really want that line there. Um, you've got a bell jar here, sitting in a trough of water, and in the trough of water we have a little crucible that floats on the water, and inside the crucible we have some red phosphorus. Notice the diagram I've borrowed very helpfully has the red phosphorus in a sort of orangey colour. And the bell jar has a hole at the top, which has a bung. And what we can do is we could take a hot glass rod, and with the bung open, you could lower the hot glass rod in and touch the phosphorus with the hot rod. And the phosphorus is so reactive that that heat causes the phosphorus to react with the oxygen inside the bell jar. So you put the hot rod onto the phosphorus and then withdraw the rod very quickly and put the bung back on the top. And what happens is the phosphorus reacts with the oxygen in the air. You see plumes of white smoke in this bell jar. And just like in the previous experiment, the water level rises up. You make something called phosphorus pentoxide, P4O10. Um, and that's a, a white powder. Um, and again, you might think, well, actually, this isn't that um, accurate. Uh, the bell jar um, doesn't have graduated lines on the side, okay? so it's not that accurate. And you could put um, some graduated lines on there to help you. But again, it's not overly accurate. It's not going to tell. It's not really going to tell you whether the percentage of oxygen in the air is fifteen percent or twenty percent. It's just not. The lines are just not that not accurate enough to do that. Um, but it certainly does show you that if you can just see here, if that's as far as the water gets, that the majority of the air is not made up of oxygen. Okay. So this experiment is quicker than the previous one. Um, but often we don't like to do it, I, mean, I, I like to do it, but often we don't do it because phosphorus is incredibly reactive uh, and some people don't like handling phosphorus. So, let's have a look at the third and final experiment which uses copper. Right, so here is 
I, well, an experiment I've done every year for the last 15 years or so. And what we have are two gas syringes. Here's one, here's a second, uh, which are connected by a piece of pipe that has some copper inside it. And at the start of the experiment, we have 100 centimetre cubed of air in one syringe and zero in the other syringe. And what happens is you push down on the plunger of this gas syringe and that forces the air in that syringe across the copper and that pushes this gas syringe out the other way. Now, when the copper is cold, nothing happens. But if you are heating the copper, as you push the air across, the oxygen in the air reacts with the copper. Okay, You actually get a reaction uh, which copper plus oxygen goes to CuO, and we should balance that equation 2 and 2, and I should put some state symbols in. Copper is a solid, oxygen is a gas, and copper oxide is also a solid. Uh, you should know the colours of these substances, so copper is orange, and copper oxide, and hopefully you can see this from this rather nice diagram, which is formed down there, is a black powder. And I'm very impressed with this stylus. My handwriting is definitely neater than usual. So, what happens is we carry on heating the copper and we push the air back and two over the copper. Okay, The copper turns black and what happens is the volume of the air gets smaller. Now when you're convinced that the volume of the air is no longer getting smaller and the way you're convinced about that isn't just by guesswork or I suspect it's getting smaller or I, can, or I suspect it's not getting smaller anymore is by reading the volume on the gas syringe until constant volume. So that's probably worth noting down. Um, stop heating when at a constant volume. And then you might think, OK, that's a great point for reading the volume of gas off the gas syringe. But no, that wouldn't be the case. At the start of the experiment, you started with 100 centimetres cubed of air, and that air was cold. And when you heat up air, it expands, as any gas does. So what we have to do is we have to allow the experiment to cool. Because otherwise it would not be a fair comparison. And what we should find out, let's see if I can move this up a little bit, that seems to be working quite nicely, is that if we started with a hundred centimetre cubed of cool air, at the end we should be left with 79 centimetre cubed of cool air. So you can see the difference between the two is 21 centimetres cubed, which is 21%. And that 21% is the oxygen. Okay, that's the oxygen which has bonded to the copper, which is no longer in the air. And that tells you that the amount of oxygen in the air is 21%. It's essential that it's allowed to cool, otherwise the volume would just be too big. Okay, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a fair test. And I'm going to pause this video there and I will restart with a preparation of oxygen using hydrogen peroxide.